this morning because you're worthy of our praise. We declare Hosanna in the highest because you have loved us. You have rescued us from hell. You have redeemed our lives through the sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, we want to praise you today, but we really want to ask that you would do what we just sang, that you would clean our hearts, that you would teach us how to see the world the way you see it so that we would, we would hurt for what grieves you. So God, we ask now that we would simply uh, be able to hear your voice as we open your word and that we would leave this place different because we've been in the presence of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Uh, Philippians chapter 1. If you do not have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. That is why they are placed there. Uh, turn to page 1247 and you will find Philippians chapter 1. Uh, by the way, if you need a Bible, uh, these are for you. If you want to read the Word of God and you don't have access to a Bible, then uh, grab one of these, take one of these, uh, let it inform you and influence your life, and we will rejoice in that. Hey, good to see you guys. Glad you made it. Philippians chapter 1. Hey, let me ask you this question. What direction is your life right now? Uh, is it up or down? Uh, are you, know, you leaning to the right, the left, or are you heading straight? Uh, are you on course or are you lost? Are you moving forward or falling back? Uh, the Apostle Paul met Jesus in a dramatic way that changed his life direction. He was on his way uh, from Jerusalem to Damascus and, and he was going there to persecute Christians and God interrupted him with a, a blinding light and Paul audibly heard a voice talking to him uh, and, and that day he went from being a persecutor of Christians to being a follower of Christ and God set him on a direction to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And it changed everything about where his life was going. And he began to live his life with a clear and compelling direction. And that was to advance the gospel. And uh, we see that as we read Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, as we continue our study called A Letter to Friends. Remember, Paul is writing to people that he knows and loves well. He says, I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it, the gospel, has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now Paul is writing to his friends in the church in Philippi, and he's writing to them from prison in Rome. Paul has been a prisoner in Rome for, uh, well, he's been a prisoner for about three or four years. He was unjustly imprisoned. Uh, he, he basically was in jail because he went to Jerusalem to worship, went to the temple. The people who hated him wanted to kill him. They started a riot, and Paul was taken into protective custody. And he remained there for up to four or five years. Uh, and, and he went from uh, Jerusalem to uh, uh, Caesarea to, uh, to Rome in, as a prisoner. And, and he's saying, look, uh, even though this has happened to me, and even though I've lived as a prisoner for all this time, uh, it really has served to advance the gospel. I, I don't know, as you read that, you don't catch the, the bitterness of a man who, who has been falsely imprisoned. What you find is somebody who says, look, even though I didn't see this happening, it's worked out okay. Don't grieve for me because it's, it's advancing the gospel. So I want us to look at Paul's words to his friends and learn some things about our life direction. And, and I want you to, as we talk through this, I want you to ask yourself that question behind this all, which is what direction is your life headed? First of all, we need to talk about what is the gospel. What is the gospel? Because Paul says, I, I want 
everything to advance the gospel. My life is about advancing the gospel. This is what it's all about. We talk about the gospel. Uh, churches everywhere mention the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, literally, the word gospel means good news. So what is this good news that we want to advance, that Paul is all about advancing that was the direction of his life? Well, to sum it up really briefly, the good news is this. God created us and loves us even in our sin. See, originally, God created us in, the, in his image, and we were, we were perfect. We were in the garden, and all of creation was perfect, and we wrecked it. Not us personally, but our you know, ancestors did. They wrecked it. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed him, and, and they ruined creation. And yet, even in our rebellion, God loves us. And he demonstrated that love in Jesus. And, and which leads us to the next point of what is the gospel. Not only did God create us and love us, even in our sin, but Jesus died to forgive us and was raised from the dead. You see, this is the the amazing truth that our sins were put on Jesus and and he took our sins to the cross and he suffered the punishment on our behalf to atone for our rebellion. The Bible literally says that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What an exchange. We gave Jesus our sin. He gave us his righteousness. That's what he did on the cross, and that's what made it possible for us to be forgiven. And Jesus declared this from the cross, that our forgiveness was complete. And if you know, or if you're familiar with the words from the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his suffering being over and the pain of the crucifixion being done. What he said was, the victory is complete. The forgiveness of people is accomplished. The forgiveness is complete. No one really paid attention to that until he walked out of the tomb. And then it was a celebration. Then we realized that death had been defeated. Our sin had been atoned for because Jesus died to forgive us and was raised from the dead. Uh, Folks, that's why it's all about Jesus. Because what he did was for us. And then the gospel continues. Not only did God create us and loves us even in our sin, not only did Jesus die to forgive us and was raised from the dead, but if we believe and follow Jesus, we have eternal life. If we believe and follow Jesus, we have eternal life. Jesus said, I think you're familiar with this, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life, have eternal life. If we believe in him, Jesus, as he walked through the villages and the countrysides of uh, Judea and Galilee, he, he often would invite people the same exact way. Follow me. Follow me. Come on and follow me. You see, if we believe in Jesus, we're going to follow him. If we follow Jesus, it's because we believe in him. You don't follow people that you don't believe and, and, and that's why we describe it as a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ here at Calvary. Because we understand that if you meet the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he's going to change your life and, and you can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. That, that's a reality. That's the good news of the gospel. If you don't like where you are and, and you become a follower of Jesus Christ, he's going to change the direction of your life. And as you follow him, he's going to lead your life in the direction that's going to bless you and give you hope and peace. That's the good news. That's the gospel. God created us and loves us even in our sin. Jesus died for our sin to forgive us and was raised from the dead. And if we believe and follow Jesus, we have eternal life. So do you believe? Do you believe the gospel? Are you following Jesus? Jesus, is he the direction of your life right now? See, if the answer is no, then you're the one who can decide today is going to be the day that you're going to step into that place of faith and you're going to say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me. I need you to change my life. I surrender to you. And and he will do that. He will begin that work in you that he will complete. You see, we don't want anyone to miss out. We want everyone to know the good news and to experience that life-changing power of Jesus Christ. So that's the gospel. We ask the question, what is the gospel? That's the gospel. And secondly, the, the direction that Paul leads us in 
is this. We rejoice in the gospel proclaimed. We rejoice in the gospel proclaimed. Uh, Verse 18 again. Hear what Paul says. This is powerful. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul says, like, uh, we're going to rejoice in the gospel proclaimed. That's our value here at Calvary as well. You see, the truth is some people didn't like the Apostle Paul. I know. You can't relate to that, can you? Because everybody likes you. Oh, wait. Some of you are married, so you have a mother-in-law. That statement's not true. Um, No, Paul had some people who didn't like him, right? I mean, they were envious of the fact that that he was uh, considered an apostle. They were envious of the fact that that churches everywhere, you know, he was starting them and and people were listening to him and following him. Some of them didn't like his theology, the fact that he was radical grace, that all you need is Jesus and and you're going to be saved, and and they wanted it to be harder. And and so these people were detractors of the apostle Paul, and, and they didn't like him. And so they had this crazy thought. They thought, hey, Paul's in prison. So he can't go preach in churches. He can't go preach in the cities. He can't engage with people out there in the streets. Guess what? We're going to show him. We're going to become more important than him. We're going to go out there and preach. And, and we're going to lead people to Christ. And we're going to become important people in the kingdom. And, and that's going to really make Paul upset. <laughs> Paul's like, I don't care. Did, didn't you hear that? He goes, I don't care why they're preaching. As long as they're preaching. It doesn't matter who's preaching. It doesn't matter why they're preaching. It just matters that Jesus is being proclaimed and people's lives are being changed. And Paul says, in that, I rejoice. He goes, I'm happy about this. And here at Calvary, we rejoice in the gospel being proclaimed no matter who is sharing the good news. That means we are for every church in this city that preaches uh, the gospel that we just shared. Every church in this city that is preaching the gospel uh, that you need Jesus and he's going to change your life and he's going to give you eternal life, we want them to succeed. We want them to grow. We want them to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ because it is about the kingdom of God, not the empire of Calvary. And, and, and you need to understand that. That's the way we are. That's, that's because the Bible teaches this, and especially the Apostle Paul teaches this over and over and over again, that we are one body in Christ, not a competition of churches. We are one body. You see, we pray for the pastors and churches in the city. We want them to succeed. When, when they are, are serving in the community, when they're baptizing people, when they're proclaiming Christ, we rejoice because there are thousands of unchurched people in this town. And even though we want to reach them all, there's no way we can reach them all alone. Because it's one body in Christ, not a competition of churches. By the way, that is not how I grew up. Can I just be honest about that? I did not grow up in churches that saw it that way. And maybe you grew up in churches like I did where, you know, if you didn't explain your relationship with Jesus Christ using exactly the same words and phrases that we did, we didn't think you were really saved. You know, and if you were a church that didn't worship like we worshiped and and preach out of the same version of the Bible that we preached out of, we didn't think you were preaching Christ at all. And we denigrate your faith and and question your relationship with God. And, and, uh, And then we... I grew up in churches that were competing with other churches for recognition and glory. And it was a sad thing to come to that, that uh, understanding. My, uh, as a teenager and, and young adult, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and going to, to college. I was working in churches uh, as, a, as a youth pastor. And so I was traveling in the circles of Baptist leadership. I was just kind of clinging to the edges. And so I'd go to these meetings and hang out at these conferences and try to learn stuff. And, and one of the things I learned was that uh, how terrible North Phoenix Baptist Church was from all these other Baptists. Because we'd get to these meetings and, and they would talk about North Phoenix Baptist Church is doing this wrong. And they're just, these people are that. And, then, and I'm thinking, wow, that's it's amazing because they were the biggest church in the city at the time. I mean, they're the biggest church, and they're doing all this stuff wrong, and it's terrible. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is, yeah, North Phoenix, I don't know about that, because, you know, all these people. So why I decided, because I don't believe people, uh, to just go to North Phoenix on a Sunday night, you know? Uh, and so uh, me and some friends went to North Phoenix, and, and you know what I found? I found that they were preaching Jesus. I found that they were people that loved Jesus, and they loved people, and they welcomed us, and, and they worshiped. And I was like, wow, so that's what envy looks like. 
And people who love Jesus can get jealous and they can slander their brothers and sisters in Christ. And then I had the privilege of serving in uh, South Georgia in a town called Albany. And uh, I was part of this church that just, they just had a self-image problem. They didn't think much of themselves and they hated this church across, and I say they, there's a lot of people in the leadership that just hated this church across town called Sherwood Baptist Church. And again, they were an evil place. You've probably heard of them because they made movies like Fireproof and uh, Facing the Giants. Yeah, terrible, right? Awful people. And, uh, and so, the, the, you know, there was just this jealousy. And, and people at the church I was at, they oh, sure would, sure would, eh, sure would. So because I wasn't from there and I wasn't, you know, raised up to hate them uh, for no apparent reason. And uh, the youth pastor of Sherwood wasn't from there either. So we decided that we would just go ahead and challenge their cultural ridiculousness and do stuff as youth groups together. <laughs> yeah, uh, people were not like, you're going to do What? Why not? They're, they kind of believe what we believe. I mean, they're, you know, related to us. They, we even got the same name hanging on the church, you know, Baptist, Southern Baptist churches. And so why don't we get together and do some stuff? And people were just, they were astonished that we would do that. We thought that was crazy, but there was this, this, uh, this jealousy that was just ripe. And, and it was not honoring to God. You see, we're one in Christ. If you love Jesus as your Savior, you're my family. I don't care what label you hang on yourself. And we need to grasp that so that we can bless one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And and a lot of times I'm asked, well, Pastor, why are there so many churches and denominations? I mean, if we're serving one Lord and we share one faith and we're subjects of one king, then why are there so many different churches? It's just wrong. We should just be one big church. And, uh, and I pondered this question for years, maybe even for decades, and I came up with this grand theological answer to that question. I want to share that with you this morning. My explanation for why there's so many churches is this. Churches are like ice cream. <laughs> now, I happen to love ice cream, and that may have influenced my theological perspective, but listen to me. And see if this doesn't make sense to you and maybe change your perspective on how you look at at, uh, the church world landscape. Because I think churches are like ice cream. How many of you guys like ice cream too? Okay, lots of hands go up. Good. See, you've got a point of reference already. So, uh, because now you can ponder theology late at night with a carton of ice cream. Uh, (laughs) May not do good for your waistline, but hey, it may help your spiritual life. So... uh, Here's the deal. Uh, I grew up, uh, oh, by the way, since we all love ice cream, uh, obviously, and we're all in church together, we almost like the same flavor. So on the count of three, let's all share our favorite flavor of ice cream. One, two, three. Uh, Yeah, we don't all like the same flavor, do we? Huh. I don't know if this is going to work. So let's try this. So um, how many of you, your favorite flavor is one of the vanilla derivatives? And when I say that, you like vanilla or French vanilla or vanilla with nuts in it or vanilla with cookies in it or or cherries in it or something like that. You're you're, you're a vanilla person with something in it. Let's see your hands. Go ahead and confess. Okay. And and how many of you are in the chocolate family? If it's chocolate or Rocky Road or chocolate, people are like, chocolate, yes, chocolate, chocolate. He said chocolate. Let's see your hands. Come on, chocolate people. Hold them up loud and proud. Okay. And, and I hate to do this to the rest of you, but how many of you are in the other family, you know, where you like <laughs> strawberry or mocha or, you know, black cherry or something like that? See, the others, come on, raise your hands. Don't be embarrassed about it. It's okay. So, so here's the deal. When I was in high school, I worked in ice cream places, okay, and, and just lots of them. I could name them all, but that's beside the point. And uh, people would always say, oh, you work with ice cream. You eat it all the time. You're going to grow tired of it. Mm, no, nope, it didn't happen. So uh, <laughs> loved working in ice cream places, and I got hired to work at the ice cream place. We're talking about the temple of ice cream places, Swenson's. And Swenson's was, <laughs> some of you have been there. So Swinson's was the best because, get this, they made the ice cream there in the store. Ah. <laughs> it was like the Holy of Holies. And, and I thought, I get to help make ice cream. I get to be there at its birth, its sweet, lovely birth. <laughs> and, and you know what I discovered at working at Swinson's and, and being there where they made ice cream and helping all that kind of stuff was that making ice cream is boring. 
It is boring. You know why it's boring? It's because 90, 95% of the ingredients are exactly the same. You put the same stuff in for every single flavor. There, there is practically no difference in every single flavor of ice cream that they have out there that they're offering you. You walk in, you can pick all these different flavors, but the only thing that separates one flavor from another is the last 5% when that's when they dump in the chocolate. That's when they throw in the nuts or the cherries or, or the fudge or whatever it is that makes it your unique favorite flavor. 95% of ice cream is identical. And that's when it hit me. Churches are like ice cream. Right? Because we just shared what the gospel is. And every church that tells you that God made you and loves you even in your sin and that Jesus died for your sin and was raised from the dead and if you believe and follow Jesus, you have eternal life. They're ice cream. And the only thing that makes us different is the flavor. The fact that some have more nuts than others. <laughs> All right, look, okay, it was just too easy. So, but see, that's what makes us different. And, it, and it's not some, you know, here's the thing. Have you ever gone into, you know, one of the ice cream places that offers you, you know, 31 flavors and sat there and argued over which flavor was Right? No, you argue over which flavor is best, but, uh, you know, basically you decide yours, your, your family decides theirs, and you don't fight over it because it's okay because it's ice cream. And, and, and that's the thing. If we're really one body in Christ and, and how are we going to relate to each other and we have our, our differences, but our differences are small compared to the lostness of the world that God has sent us into. And, and if we can understand that, that we're really just ice cream, it allows us to, to relate differently to our friends and family that are, are other flavors. Because we can bless them and we can encourage them and we can celebrate with them. Because we don't have to argue about who's right. We can just argue over which flavor we like better. And by the way, I, I really appreciate the fact that you like Calvary's flavor. Okay. Now, I have to tell you this because it's really important, and, and this illustration breaks down if you don't hear this last part, and, and that is this. A few years ago, this abomination swept across our nation. It, it's called, um, you know, stores that sell frozen yogurt. <laughs> and, uh, and some of you, uh, you know, commit ice cream idolatry, and you worship at the frozen yogurt places, and, uh, and you even have cute little names for it. Let's go get Froyo. Uh, and... <laughs> And stuff, uh, and I confess that every now and then I, I visit those shrines as well. But, um, but here's the thing. Frozen yogurt is not ice cream. I mean, they go, oh, it tastes the same, and it looks the same, and it's cold like that. But the ingredients are radically different. And there are churches that are frozen yogurt. They're not preaching the same gospel. They're not sharing the same truth. They're not relying on the same authority. And you need to understand that uh, there's a difference between ice cream and frozen yogurt. And, and there are churches that, that may say they're like us and they may look like us. And sometimes they even taste like us, but they're not us. They're not ice cream. And, and you just need to be aware of that because it's not okay uh, to go, ah, ice cream, frozen yogurt's all the same because it's different. Um, by the way, we, we, want, we want this truth to sink in because we want you to really be able to bless uh, our brothers and sisters, even if they don't agree that we're family. Uh, we want you to, to live life being able to, to put the arguments aside and just celebrate the fact that we're one in Christ. And so we decided to give all of your children free ice cream today. Not, not downstairs. It's not going to be a mess and they're going to have chocolate. We gave them uh, gift certificates provided by Katie and Cole's Water and Ice for a free cone. And so, uh, but here's the thing. When you take them to get the ice cream, you talk to them by, about churches being like ice cream. You explain the spiritual truth uh, on their level and uh, have a good conversation so that uh, you can lead your kids to a spiritual talk while you're blessing your kids with uh, a sweet tooth. So, we rejoice in the gospel being proclaimed. That's what Paul's saying. That's the direction of his life. And then finally, uh, the direction of his life takes him to the whatever it takes mentality. The whatever it takes mentality. Uh, I hope you noticed in this passage that Paul is rejoicing from 
prison. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? He's rejoicing from prison. He's saying, hey, look, my being in prison is good because it advances the gospel. Because here's what's happening. They're, they're chaining me up next to these uh, you know, imperial guards, praetorian guards, and, and I, they, they're there all day long. i got nothing else to do but talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> and so Paul is sharing faith, his faith with the guards. The guards are sent all over the empire, and some of them are coming to faith, and they're taking the gospel with them all over the empire. Isn't that cool? And Paul says, because I'm not uh, afraid to share the gospel in prison, other believers are finding out that they can share it with boldness too. They can share the good news about Jesus with boldness. And so it's a good thing that I'm in prison. That is a whatever it takes mentality. And I want you to know Calvary's commitment is to have a whatever it takes mentality to uh, reaching our community for Jesus. We're going to do whatever it takes because we have 35 to 40,000 unchurched people in this community that need to know the good news that Jesus loves them and forgives them if they will follow him. And so we'll do whatever it takes. Takes five worship services, done. I know we just went back to four for the summer, but hey, five worship services, we've been doing that. We need to build a larger sanctuary and parking lot? Well, it's in process. Looks kind of cool, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I know. Hey, you guys... After they're you know, done working during the day, you should go out there and stand on that and pray for what God's going to do when we're, when we're in it. It'd just be really cool. And, and plus, it's just cool to stand on it. You know, take your rollerblades because it's really slick out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, if it takes us serving our community, then we will do that in whatever form or fashion that we can think of. Raise money for our schools, no problem. By the way, LHC4Kids.com, uh, let's put our money where our mouths are at that point. We really care about the kids, and let's give. Um, we will do whatever it takes to advance the gospel. That's our commitment. What's yours? Will you do whatever it takes? What are you willing to do? Will you praise God in difficult circumstances? Will you make sacrifices for Jesus? Will you invite your friends and your family to church? Will you support the ministries in the building financially? Will you be kind and caring and generous person out in our community, representing Christ well? Will you love your spouse and kids in a way that honors God? You see, that's the direction that God is calling us to. Is that the direction that your life is headed? And if not, what are you going to do to change that? Will you do whatever it takes to share the good news that there is life in Jesus? Paul said that's what his life was all about. That's where the blessed life will take us. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the grace that overwhelms our lives. Thank you that you were willing to do whatever it took to save us from our sins, even sacrificing your one and only son. And, and Lord, today, uh, we, we just want to be yours. We want to be children that make you happy. We want to be servants that advance the gospel. Teach us how to do that. Change the direction of our lives so that we can follow you better. This is our prayer so that your, your gospel can penetrate this community and change lives by the thousands. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.